Welcome everybody, this is Major Mark and thank you so much for joining us on webinar number three. And we're gonna get started right now. I've actually forgot to hit record for the first five minutes of the actual webinar. So I need to, I'm just doing this actually by myself. So Major Meadows is gonna kick in in a few minutes. So this is uh, of course myself and Major Meadows. She still has not updated her photo. So she gets the one standing next to the canine Got a purchase OPI from our endo course. So just a brief um, COVID update. There was a frequently asked questions document that was placed, that was sent out, and I placed it on the workplace. Um, so if you haven't seen this, you can email me. I'm sure you've seen it by now. And uh, Major Max Fournier is the lead gathering all these this incredible information. So thank you to him. Um, and we're going to be having a webinar with him just about some of the commonly asked questions uh, in a few weeks. So I was talking with uh, Captain Bryce Smiley. He is my sort of uh, social media go-to guy. And I'm not advertising my uh, All Things Dentistry, but what I'm trying to do is trying to figure out the best place for me to post this information that we're collecting. Um, the workplace is a great place for a course, uh, but I know that in about literally two weeks it's going to be no one's going to go on it so what i'm going to do is i'm going to try posting um the stuff that's going to fall out that we need to use for the covid on uh, all things dentistry on my instagram and we're just going to place it there i did create a private instagram uh, place but it's not that effective so what you're going to see is we're going to walk through a free molar endo course uh it's the next level it's the next iteration of the online course that i created for canadian forces dental corps world canadian dental corps uh so we're gonna see, you're gonna see a bunch of that stuff so without further ado what we're gonna do is we're gonna get started with major meadows and the operatory setup okay so this is our endo setup uh, we have the x-ray up for the patient and everything is barriered we have our portable x-ray unit in the bay. Um, we have a closed door as well. We have extras on our tray because we were trying to think, okay, what if something falls? And so I know minimal is usually what we recommend, but again, we, you will see that there's some extra instruments on here. We have extra um, rubber dam clamps. We have sterile cotton pellets, rubber dam ready to go. And we have an extra rubber dam off to the side. Then again, we have our, our solutions labeled, calcium hydroxide, opal dam. We have temporary material, extra paper points, extra uh, needles for um, anesthetic, extra uh, micro tips as well. So we have our root ZX, and then we have our files off to the side with our anesthetic and endo ice. And again, you can see we have extra, but in these times we're trying to make sure that if something were to drop or you need more files, people are not having to leave the room to get things. Our amalgamator and curing light is ready to go as well. Move over to the operator tray. Uh, just minimal setup, exam with a two sleuth. Uh, also our endo access kit that we will review. So the other piece of equipment now that you're going to need set up, if you're using Wave 1, you're going to need your Promark motor. And then you have your element system. There's different presets. So right now we're already in preset number 2 for Wave 1. I can go up to preset number 1, and that's path files. Preset number 3, and that's Pro Taper Next. Pro Taper Universal, and then Vortex. If you wanted to go in and change your speed and torque, you can. Okay, so what I'm going to show you now is how to utilize your electric hand pieces for non-surgical root canal therapy uh, if you don't have a Promark motor or if you don't want to take your Promark motor into the operatory as we're trying to reduce the number of items that need to be in the operatory during these times. So you'll see here that I have two hand pieces set up. This one is a 8 to 1 um, gear reduction hand piece. Um, and then this is a one-to-one -one latch hand piece. I don't know if you can see that, there you go. Both have pro taper next uh, rotary files. How to set your control panel 
to allow you to use the specific hand piece that you have. So first thing you're going to do is turn on the chair. Then what you're going to do, I'm going to pick up this one hand piece. This is the A to 1. And you can see there that it automatically brings up operative or endo. So we're going to select endo. And right now, this was already preset. So endo file 1. So that just means endo file 1. If I was using a multi-system that had different... Uh, different torque recommendations or different RPM recommendations, um, you could set those as well. So we'll go back to file one. The ratio is eight to one, and you want to confirm that that's what your handpiece is set at. Your RPM, so for Pro Taper Next, 300 RPMs is um, sufficient, 300 to 320. And then the torque can be anywhere between three and 4.2 Newton centimeters. So this one is already set up and ready to go. So next I'm going to show you how to set up the one-to-one, -one, if that's the only handpiece that you have. So this is a one-to-one. -one. As you can see, the head is a lot bigger than the eight-to-one, and which makes it a little bit more difficult to see when doing endodontic procedures. So if you come over here again, you can go select endo. And the ratio that we're going to want to select, you can see it says eight-to-one, but that's not what we have in there. We want one-to-one. -one. Now the RPMs is definitely too high, so then you can see that you would not want that in a um, canal. So we're going to change your RPMs down. So you could go in here and find something closer to 300, which is what I did. Okay, and I hit uh, OK, so I'll go back out. So I'm going to hit OK to go in, and then these arrows you can just select to change it. Then your torque. So for the one-to-one, -one, it's going to be a percentage. And um, the maximum you can have is 3.5 with this uh, percentage for the handpiece. So this is what you're going to select 100%. And then this one, you could hit uh, save and hit OK. Okay, so right now what I'm going to do is I just want to review my operator table setup. So right now I always have my mirror and my endo explorer. I prefer the mirror with the ruler on it because that's how I measure my files. And then we have our endo access kit for those who haven't seen this. Um, and I also have a Mueller burr there for tropping and then I have a, a polishing point for near the end of the procedure. Um, I always keep my root ZX or my apex locator, whichever brand I'm using, on the tray. And so, um, as you can see, I'm gonna turn it off to start, sorry. And so, I'm gonna turn it on before I plug the probe in because it needs a moment to calibrate before I plug it in. So I'm gonna just come to the side here, plug it in. Then what you wanna do is just do a function test just to make sure that you have connection. So again, I don't normally let this hang here, but I'm doing it because I'm one-handed. Almost got it. So you can see I'm just confirming that when I hit the two, the lip the clip and the file that, part that goes on your file that we have connection. Absolutely. So with regards to access, so that's the other part of this. So we've talked about setting up and I really appreciate uh, what Reagan's put together because that's, you know, some sometimes you just don't know what you're using and how to use it and where to put it. Now we're going to talk about access. Now, you know, I only have... 20 more minutes to talk about this. So I've got two videos and it's really gonna be talking about the two critical things because everyone is probably comfortable using a premolar, doing an anterior tooth, doing this, doing that. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put up two situations. So it's gonna be a mandibular molar because that's usually the one that causes, well, the maxillary molar causes the most grief. Everyone wants to find MB2. So I'm gonna show a couple tips about that and we'll go through the mandibular molar. Now, if you haven't, if you've gone on the, on the uh, workplace site, this is the video that I, I uploaded to there. So let's go ahead and just walk through that. and. If it's choppy for you, it will be in the replay, the full uh, high resolution version. This is one, one spot here. You can see this is a classic kind of idea. And this, I really like this. This is from Tronstad from many years ago. And he was big into determining the final apical size of these of your of teeth. So not only do you have you know the classic diagram of where the orifices are, if you look over at the maxillary molar or mandibular molar. 
So you've got four. We all know we're looking for the MB2. That's that's not a secret anymore. Really, what you're looking for are the tips on how to find these damn things. The other thing I really want you to take a look at, and you, if you can see it, great, is the ISO size. So the instrument size of most of what he found of the size of the apical constrictor. And most of the teeth are going to be at a 35 or 40. So that can be argued left, right, and center, depending on who you're looking at, whether it's Bertucci and other sizes. of. I mean, this is, Endo's full of this stuff. But just keep that in the back of your mind if you really want to do a predictable pulpectomy and final uh, instrumentation on your teeth. So I'm going to mute myself now, and so you don't get that. Mute myself, and off we go. And we're going to take our number, sur number four long surgical burr, and the first thing I'm going to do in 90% of the time is remove the restoration. And what that helps me do is it allows me to one, see if there's a crack running mesial distal or even sometimes buccal to lingual. But also the second part is that it removes that pain in the butt factor of having a metal restoration. Obviously, this doesn't apply to composite, but when you have a metal restoration and you're trying to get a working length with the apex locator, oh my gosh. And we've got some tips about that too, uh, how to prevent any having issues with your apex locator. But honestly, just remove that restoration and make sure that that tooth is restorable. If there's a huge crack, you you know this is a great time. If, if you have forgotten to mention it to the patient before, and you see this is a good reminder. So you've forgotten to mention this tooth might be cracked. Your tooth might not be savable. You've forgotten to mention that. But once you remove that re existing restoration, whether it's composite or amalgam, it's a good reminder to say, oh, you know what? I totally forgot to tell you. I just removed your filling. This is a, and then, you know, I'm going to be looking for a crack and you can discuss that. It's really important to kind of discuss what that means to them. Uh, obviously with a rubber dam and reminding them at that point is not the most effective time, uh, but at least it tells you, it gives them a warning of, oh, okay, he's looking for a crack and they kind of have an idea what that is. So what I've done is I've removed the, the restoration and now we're going to continue straight into where the, uh, the pulp chamber is. Remember this pulp is fairly wide open. so. I'm going to make a small, in this case, I elected to do a small little access opening. And the beauty of using the high speed electric, so this is our BN Air, and the BN Air rep told me that. So, what I've done there, right there, is the BN Air rep told me that if you can't remember what's blue, you know, we've got blue or red ones. Red is for danger, high speed, blue is for the slow speed. Just a simple little reminder. So what I do routinely on almost every endo, I'm, if I haven't gotten in the pulp chamber, I'm gonna be looking to see where the shank of that bird changes. The shank of the bird changes in direction, in diameter, so, or just in kind of the shape. So you've got where it goes from this point down to the tip of the bird, and that's six millimeters long. So I'm looking to see if I've dropped into the pulp chamber, and I haven't yet. And honestly, one of the things I always notice, and it, at the beginning of doing this, I used to get really worried, is seeing that white. Before you hit the pulp chamber, you often see that little bit of white dentin, really bright white dentin. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pop right into that pulp chamber. This is a great time you can give your patient um, a intrapulpal uh, anesthesia. You know, that's, a, that's, the, uh, that's the practice winner on that one uh, if the patient's in pain. But here what I'm gonna be doing is I'm just looking for if there's any hemorrhage, whether the tooth is necrotic or not, and just actually if I perforate it. Now, if you perforate it and you don't know, and you're really worried, just stop, take a breath. Don't rinse out with sodium hypochlorite. You can use water. Take your take a work, take a hand file like a number ten, place it into the pulp chamber or where that perforation you think is, and if the apex locator screams PDL, then you probably got um, likely a perforation. But there's no need to worry. It's only a tooth. It'll be okay. You know, reassure that you can mention it to the patient, reassure the patient, and then close that tooth up and refer that patient off if you don't have the right tools. So again, we've gotten into the pulp chamber. We're just taking a look. Obviously, it's necrotic. So the first things that I'm going to be looking for is, um, am I in the pulp chamber? What am I doing? Are there any attached? Do I see any pulp stones? Now, in our previous, in our radiograph, we didn't see any, but you know, routinely I'll just be flicking around with my my um, endo explorer just to see if I have any attached or detached kind of loose pulp stones and the next stage we're gonna be doing is taking that endo zebra and we're gonna be placing that round 
tip right on the pulp chamber, literally right on the pulp chamber floor, and I'll let it trace all the way around my endo access. So even though I've removed my composite restoration or the amalgam restoration or my composite restoration, I don't need to make my access the whole size of the tooth. We're going to keep it just the size that we need. The next stage is I just turn that burr on its side and I, sh I shoe the cuffs. Now, this gives me an accurate, re you know, an a, a, a reference points that's stable that I can use over and over and over again for my working length. But in these COVID times, what you can do is even take a diamond burr and flatten this, take even another millimeter off because the last thing you want to do is do a great pulpectomy or pulpotomy and then the patient bites on the tooth and breaks it and is in more pain. So I would almost, you know, level off two millimeters right off the get-go and that allows you easier access, like I said before, easier access to the orifices and honestly keeps the patient from uh, biting because we might not be seeing these patients for a, a long period of time. So now we've gone is we've gone into the into the pulp chamber because this is necrotic. Definitely, this would need a pulpectomy to remove all the necrotic material. Again, like I said, I'm just trying to flick any of the pulp tissue. I'm trying to see if there are any stones that I can get out of there because the last thing and I've done it before is get stones lodged down a canal and it's really tough if you lodge it well enough, um, which I have done. Uh, it's tough to get those out of there. And then I'm just looking to see. Okay, so we've got some pulp tissue there. And we've all done this, just taking our endo explorer, kind of flicked around, you know, just randomly. It's almost like you feel grateful that you're into the pulp without having a <laughs> without having a perforation. So we're gonna go up high magnification. And what I'm looking for now is again, in a in a if I'm looking for a crack, the crack will normally progress from the distal me distal marginal ridge down and I'm and same for the mesial marginal ridge, I'd be looking for if it crosses a pulp chamber, that's fine. But if it crosses a pulpal floor, then prognosis decreases. I'm also looking for a crack that goes down into one of the orifices or down straight down to the floor of the pulp chamber. Uh, so let's take a look here what we have. So if this is the buckle of our tooth. This is our mesial buccal orifice. There's our mesial lingual. I can't really show you what it looks like in this video because the extracted tooth, it's, it's the setup, there's no lingual inclination to the tooth. So it's not going to show you getting into the lingual uh, canal first. I do have a bunch of live cases, cases where we can do that. And then we're going to be using our law, our law of symmetry. So in this case, because I'm using high magnification and I can angle the tooth any which way I want, I'm only going to make this axis like this. But if I'm not sure, what I would do is I'd make that more of a square to be able to make sure because I have burned myself by missing a distal canal. And I'm using the obviously the law of symmetry you've heard. This is a dark de developmental groove down the midline. So the equidistant part is, if we compare it, we'll just talk about uh, laws of symmetry. We've got the middle of the tooth. This, you know, mesial buckle is equidistant from the middle line to the, it's equidistant on the other side. So what does that mean? This orifice is the same distance from the midline as this orifice. And then in the distal, let's see if we get a good view of it. It's still a little more difficult to see. There's our one orifice right there. And as we clean and shape this more, you might actually find another canal pop up. So that's it for our mandibular molar access. And please some comments. Let me know if this was helpful. Cheers. Now let's take a look at a couple access, little hints and tips that we've figured out along the way of this journey. So if this is our mandibular molar, and we've all seen this type of access, this is a pretty standard access, and that's what we're going to uh, talk about here. You know, the, the red really outlines kind of where the, the standard orifices are going to be, if this is the buckle of the tooth and this is a lingual. So we're looking for our mesial buckle around here, our mesial lingual over here. And we need to remember that our distal canal is typically oval shaped. So what I'll find normally is you'll be able to find one canal, maybe if this is the midline, you'll find it kind of like right here. And using the laws of symmetry, you really got to look on the other side of that line. And even if you find uh, of that midline to find that other canal, because a missed canal can lead to failure. It's the most common cause of failure of root canal teeth. So again, review that article by Krasner and Ranko in 2004. So some really simple tips. In my experience has been, you know, in a tooth that we have a fairly oval wide pulp chamber, you got three different ways of getting into that tooth. So this arrow really indicates and I couldn't find a line to draw so I used an arrow 
but it really shows you how much distal from the mesial marginal ridge you can go so it's almost in the center of the tooth before you hit right down kind of with the bulk of the pulp chamber so what I used to do when I started off I used to actually start my axis is like really close to the marginal ridge I have no idea why and then I'd be digging I'd be ledging in here so what I've done over time and practice with extracted teeth and you know over 3,000 cases I've slowly moved my axis a little more distally. So when I have, you know, really the way the pulp chamber, the way I see the pulp chamber on the radiograph really shows me what I can, the different techniques I can do. So if I've got a symptomatic irreversibly inflamed tooth, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, and I have an axis like this, I'm going to drop right into almost the center of the tooth down to six millimeters. And then what that does is it allows me to, first of all, gauge whether the patient feels any pain. And if they do, then I can give them an intrapulpal. Now the reason why a small little axis hole is good for that is because then I can try to build up as much pressure as possible into that pulp because that's really what's effective. You're not getting any of that soft tissue biochemical change of pH of the anesthetic from acid to base. You're really just using a pressure of literally that fluid into there, into the pulp tissue to uh, provide you with uh, anesthesia. Another technique, so if I, you know, another technique you can do even with a large, if the tooth is necrotic, what I'm going to do is normally, I don't normally will drop in, but what I'll do is I'll do a groove back and forth, kind of in the middle of the tooth to about three millimeters, just kind of where three millimeters back from the marginal ridge, just back and forth, back and forth till I drop in. Because the tooth is necrotic, I'm not that worried about having any anesthesia issues. And once I drop in here, what this does is gives me a bigger range of, kind of like getting finding access and not hitting too much into this mesial, uh, mesial part of the tooth. And honestly, the standard way of doing it is doing more of a square. You can, I mean, you've been taught, the problem with kind of doing the, the standard triangular oval shape is that you miss, you can potentially miss one of the canals. And I have a case that I actually did one, miss one of the canals and pulled it up and revealed it on an x-ray that I missed the canal and we'll talk about it later, it severely calcified. So these are the three different techniques you can use uh, in your extracted teeth or even your, obviously you're aiming for live teeth. So what I'm going to do is if, because in this COVID time, you're still going to see teeth with symptoms, people with symptoms. And being in Ottawa, um, I was talking to a buddy of mine, uh, Dr. Odai is an endodontist, no endodontist is seeing patients right now. So that means that we're going to be seeing our patients and you're going to be seeing cases like this. Maybe not this significant, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a couple tips right off the bat. And the one is to create your orifice, your axis outline up front. There's no way you're going to drop into here and try to feel something. This tooth is fairly manageable with high power. With It's fairly straightforward with obviously a lot of practice and a mag microscope, but with you and your loops, if you've got three and a half times loops with a bright light, you'd probably be able to access this and get some help. This is obviously the right side of the scale in terms of difficulty. Uh, but even, you know, cases you don't see like this, if you've got more of a pulp chamber, draw out your axis outline up top. And honestly, you can even make it a little bit bigger because what that's going to do is it's going to give you more light to get access in the, into that tooth. And what I would do is, Shoo off all the cuss first, do your access, and what we're trying to do is, we're trying to try to get closer to this. So if you removed half this tooth in the COVID time, you removed, say, two millimeters off the top, now you're two millimeters closer to the orifices. Try to make your life as easy as possible, and then just outline your access. I get it if you feel nervous. Don't get me wrong. Not only is the outline, the pulp chamber, whatnot, important, but also the angulation of the tooth in, in the mandible. And if this is... Uh, mandibular molar tooth number three seven or three six this is the lingual side of the tooth and this is the buckle you can see how it's just very subtle but this tooth is just angled more towards the lingual part of the of the mandible so what happens is when you go to access this tooth and you put your rubber dam clamp on the tooth so the rubber dam clamp then almost makes the tooth look perpendicular in the mouth because this is how you put it on and then when you go to access with your number four long surgical round burr you go, you know, when you go straight down the tooth, this is a little bit more to the mesial or the lingual, but honestly, every time, and I've tried to test this, every time you go in, and if you can't find, if you only find one mesial canal, assume it's the lingual canal, 100% of the time. I've tried to test it, and it has rung true all the time. 
Because what happens is when you, you can see it, just that the angulation of the tooth, you come straight in with your burr, and the first thing you're gonna, the first orifice you find is the mesiolingual. Now the other point is that the most often time you're gonna perforate is gonna be towards the lingual, because if this tooth is angled even more, and you're just going straight in, what's going to happen is that bird's going to, you're going to remove more of the lingual tooth structure. So it's really critical to be cautious of that because I'm sure we've all been down that road. And if you haven't done a molar yet, just be cautious that you need to angle your burr relative to the long axis of the tooth. And how do you do that? Well, just take a look at the way the tooth is in the mouth before you put your rubber dam clamp on. So once we do our axis, we take our endo zebra or pulp shaper burr and what's critical about this burr is that this is a non-cutting tip. Now our clinics sometimes purchase these brasser burrs that are gold shank with these carbide flutes but they don't have this round ball they've got a straight end so I've almost been burned by that before make sure you can run your finger over the bottom of that burr and not cut it because if it's a cutting tip because there are burrs like that with a 90 degree cutting edge it's not <laughs> your tooth is not going to end very well. Okay, so that is talking about the mandibular molar, and hopefully there was a couple tips in there. I know that uh, when I was cutting it, I totally forgot that we can't use loops. So, you know, we are using goggles, and one of the key things I think that the real big takeaway for me would be to, you know, level that tooth off as low down as you need to, to make sure you can access those, uh, those orifices as simply as possible. Make your life easy. Don't try to, you know, start from the top, because if our crown is 10 millimeters high, you can reduce it by two to three millimeters, Make it easy for yourself. Make it predictable so you feel confident. Because there's, we all know that endo can be a confidence sucker. So that's talking about a mandibular molar. And let's go ahead and just take a look at a maxillary molar. This is a very interesting case that was uh, that was in the clinic that we talked about, that worked with uh, one of our captains with. And just go ahead and well, let's take a look. All right, let's take a look at this cracked tooth and let's talk about accessing into a maxillary molar and let's use this really kind of neat case. So this tooth, actually, let's take a look at the radiograph. This tooth was presented on as an emergency case and the you can see on the bite wing, the patient had long lost the res restoration and was now had symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. And if we take a look at the periapical radiograph, you got that this really interesting fracture right down the center of the tooth. And often you'll see those and you think that the there's a problem with the x-ray, or if you're using the old uh, plates, it's bent, but it, you know, it hasn't. It's actually, that is the fracture. So let's take a look. The tooth is not necrotic. So let's take a look and see if we can save this. So, and we're gonna talk about doing a... Usually they yep. run front to back. Hers yeah. is running like... So I'm just uh -huh. talking with uh, one of my students here. So we're gonna see, we don't have any probe inductions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna place our secondary seal uh, with opal dam. And then as you can well, see, we have the rubber dam clamp still open. So we need to close those up to make sure we don't get any saliva into our into our endo and also our irrigants into the oral cavity. So what I've done there is to track, I've taken methylene blue dye, and this is literally, I haven't touched the, haven't touched the tooth at all. This is the way it presented. And you can see we've got this fracture running all the way down from the mesial, mesial of the tooth. So if this is the mesial buckle, this is the palate. We've got that fracture line running just through the pulpal floor or the, the roof of the pulp chamber. So we're going to check to see if this tooth is still restorable. And then likely we have, you know, if we look at the periapical radiograph, um, likely we have just a, this is probably where we've got some tertiary dentin and that's what we're seeing right there. So let's let this play. We've now... I'm going to take my endo explorer and see if uh, if that's you know soft or not. And no, it's definitely calcified material, and that's where the stain the stain uh, resided. And you can see it here. So what we're going to do is I'm going to use this long shank Munzburr. This is a number two, and I'm just going to run back and forth. So what I'm doing is I'm picking a spot between the mesobuccal cusp and the palatal cusp, kind of right here. And we're going to run, make a line back and forth and back and forth. And you can see the, the tooth is actually not that calcified. So it's going to be pretty simple to get into it. So what my dental assistant is doing right at this moment, and you can see it just up in the corner here, she's blowing air over this. So what that does is it gets all the air 
the dent and debris out of the way and you can keep a nice clean field. And you're gonna see me pop into the pulp chamber right there. And what that tells us is indeed, our diagnosis was correct. It's still vital and she did respond to cold. So uh, that's to be expected. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna keep using my Munzburr in this situation. We could use an endo zebra, but honestly, I wanted to just use this and unroof the pulp chamber. I'll do this in some cases like this. Uh, my student was watching the preparation, so I wanna go a little bit slower um, and use these slow round burrs. So literally what I'm doing is I'm just unroofing that pulp chamber and we're just doing that. So we can watch it here as we move towards, so this is where our mesial buccal orifice is gonna be. And now I'm just unroofing where our distal buccal orifice is gonna be. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna still try to keep this as conservative as possible, but we need to be able to clean and shape effectively. So I'm not gonna blow out this whole, you know, where the restoration was before. So what I'm doing here is there's two ways you can do this. There's another way you can use an endo zebra. And what I did is I elected just to use a fine diamond. There's lots of different ways you can do this. So I'm just using fine diamond. I'm not using any water. You can use water. You don't have to. And we've elected to do the pulpectomy in this case because she did walk in uh, with symptomatic irreversible pitis and symptomatic apical periodontitis. Um, so we didn't have enough time to do a complete therapy. And we wanted to actually see if we get some resolution of her symptoms with just the pulpectomy before proceeding to finish the complete endodontic therapy because there's always a risk of you know doing the endo in these cases and the tooth fails because of that crack. So this is this is what I'm going to do. I usually use my this is number one. So I'll open up the, the orifice, open up the pulp chamber, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my wave one gold primary. I'm going to open up my orifices, and at the same time we got a little treat. We all know as dentists it's some kind of weird thing when we get the full pulp out. It's uh, it's actually quite it's actually useful because now we've gotten rid of that tissue. But it's also kind of interesting, just I don't know why. We just want to see, we're going fishing for worms, I guess. Just one of those weird things we do. So we're going to remove that. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use my wave and gold file. And um, you can see how I angled that really little subtle angle of my mirror. What I did was I'm looking, I'm gonna open up my orifices just to the cutting flutes. So most teeth are roughly 21 to 19 mil, you know, 19 to 21 millimeters long. We're going to open the coronal two thirds of all these canals roughly to two thirds. So it's like 14 to 16 millimeters. So what we're going to do is I'm going to open the coronal two thirds just with this wave and gold right away. I'm using the existing hemorrhage and I'm using some of the pulp tissue just as lubricants. And what I found is that after doing this for about almost 10 years now, it's a really quick way to open up those cases, get some irrigant down there. And then I can tackle my working length. So I'm just kind of going back and forth. It's really light brushing techniques. I'm actually using the hemorrhage in the pulp chamber to empty the flute, the debris in the flutes. And what this does as well, as you'll see here, is it actually helps to stop any of the hemorrhage. Once I remove that, you know, the coronal two thirds of that pulp tissue, all of a sudden the hemorrhage stops and you're not battling to try to just get your files in there. Because even I found, even if you use like an SX and you open up the corona, the orifice, you know, that pulp is irritated as all heck and it just continues to hemorrhage. So what we're going to do here is now, I'm gonna, now I've opened up the coronal two thirds of those canals. I'm going to take my number six file and, you know, I've honestly started to use a number six file routinely rather than starting with an eight. And what I'm doing there is you can see that I've made a little bit of curve and I'm actually dancing the file around according to the unidirectional stop. So that's all I'm doing. I'm down the distal buckle, and some, you know, typically if it doesn't drop, there's going to be a little hook going towards the distal. I can use my apex locator. Let's get a initial working length, and let's do that for all our other canals. So we're going to do that with all our other canals. We're going to find an initial working length. We're going to get start our glide path. We can talk about that later. But really, in this access video, we want to talk about MB2 because you know. I know that what you you know is you want to look for that MB2. So one of the tricks that I was taught is if you can draw a line from the mesial buccal orifice, you can't see it here, but it's right underneath this cusp to the palatal, draw a straight line. And if you bisect that line from the, from the distal buccal, you can take a look often right around this area. 
Now this is sort of a, a ledge, and what we're going to do is instead of talking, I'm going to show you what happens. So I use my Endo Explorer, and I can feel a little. There's like a little right there. I felt there's like a little, a little dimple, and I'm going to explore that. I can't tell you for sure if that's MB2, but let's take a look and see what happens. So I'm going to take my Munspur, and I'm literally just going to brush away the dentin in that spot, and you're going to see a little white dot show up. So I'm just doing a nice light brushing technique and I'm moving it towards the mesial. So as you can tell, what I'm not doing, and it's totally a, you know acceptable, I used to do this, you can make your access a little bit bigger. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to conserve some of that dentin and look at that dot. That is a beautiful little dot. So essentially what's happened, instead of using ultrasonics, I use round burrs. The, the debris from the dentin actually collects into that little into the little orifice. So what I'm gonna do now is we're gonna take a six file and let's see if we get any engagement. Actually, what I'm gonna do, I lied. I'm gonna move that more mesially. And let's see if we can get some engagement with a six file. And there's so many different ways of tackling that. This is a this honestly, this case was a gimme. This one was pretty simple because you you know you I felt this felt a stick with the the endo with my endo explorer. And now I'm going to take a six. You can see the curve on it. And you could argue that I don't have straight line access, and I don't. So you can remove. I'm trying to be a little more conservative on this technique. Um, I've been doing this a bit of a you know for a long time. But what you can do is you can, you know, if you can't get access into that, because what happens is the file comes straight out the distal, you know, op remove that dentin. This is the distal buckle. This is the palate. This is MB1 and this is MB2. Really what I was doing with that Munzburr is removing this little ledge, because what happens is you can see the MB2, as it enters into the pulp chamber, comes in at almost a 45 degree angle. So really what we need to do is we need to, again, remove that, that ledge. Because what happens is if we don't remove it, our file actually, you always... I remember doing this initially was, it's like, oh, my, my canal, the MB2 is calcified. Well, what actually what happens is that file is hitting straight here, and it can't, I mean, this is a, almost a 90-degree curve to try to get this apically. So by removing this a significant amount, then we can get that file to go straight down. So what I'm doing now is I'm just taking a six file, and we're going to slowly place it in there. You can see there's two points I want to mention. One is you can see the, the difference between where we started with the initial catch with the endo explorer and how much more measly we removed it. So we removed that essentially that piece of the equation out of that equation. And now we've got this curve file and I need to have a curve just because I'm conserving this amount of dentin. You can literally remove that and you'll be good to go. So we're gonna place that in the canal, get a little catch and really we're just gonna watch wine a little bit. And it's pretty flimsy, it's like a wet, wet spaghetti noodle. We're going to put a lot of pressure on it, just nice, just some watch winding. And then what we're going to do is we're going to, you can see it in better magnification there. So we're just trying to get a little bit of sodium perchlorate down that or down that canal, into that orifice. And then we're going to start with, uh, we'll do that. Then we're going to work up to an eight. Next, we're going to step up to an eight file, same curve. Sneak it in there, just do a little watch winding, and all we're trying to do is little by little is open that up. And we'll take a 10 file, and they're going to repeat. Place that in there, and what I'm looking for as I'm doing this is I'm looking to see how far am I getting closer. The easiest marker I've got is just the cutting flutes on the, the 16 millimeter, so let's see how far I can. That's really what I'm looking for. I'm gauging, you can see here, that's exactly what I'm doing here, is I'm gauging to see where the cutting flutes are and where I'm at. So we'll just create a little bit more space, and then I'm going to go back with a six file down the same road. And let's see if we've made any, any difference. You can see how we've gotten a little bit further down now. We're getting close to the cutting end of the cutting flutes. And one of the tips is really if this eight file or six file just drops. We get it to about here and then the file drops. There's a high probability that those two mesial canals, 40% of the time, they're gonna join.
Okay, so that kind of goes over um, kind of a Maxway Molar uh, access. That actually was Captain Shervani. I'm not sure if you've met him. He was supposed to head for VDOC this year, but uh, he found that case. And later on, um, we actually, I will post it on the Instagram or the and the workplace to show kind of the cleaning and shaping stages because we did do a pulpectomy, cleaning and shaping, and then obturation, and then he crowned the tooth afterwards. So that pretty much covers what we wanted to talk to today. One of the tips that uh, this was Les Campbell. He was a major. He was did the uh, he did an endo residency after he retired. He really taught. I think Reagan, Reagan, Reagan Reagan's a lot better than me. So she probably knew this tip. But I was she. He taught me the six eight ten rule. So if you don't know what that is, that's an incredible tip. It's on the workplace. I'll throw it on uh, on Instagram. And it's a really great way to use for if you can't if you blocked yourself out of canal if you need to open up something. Uh, I think, you know, Reagan, maybe next week we'll talk about your tip to, uh, if you can't get to the, maybe instead of cleaning, actually part of the cleaning shaping, instead of obturation, let's do like, if you block yourself out, you have a, I don't want to, we can't let the cat out of the bag because no one's going to show up. You know how you open up to a certain file size and then you, then you yeah, keep. I know what you're doing. Yeah, I know so what you're let's, doing about. let's not let the cat out of the bag and we'll save that for next week because that's really helped me. You know, you try to get your file down to working length and you're like. I can't get it down there. Well, Reagan showed me actually an incredible tip that's probably worked, I'd say maybe 10% of the time. I'm just kidding. Uh -huh. Only like, yeah, 80% of the time, it's been super effective to help uh, decrease those frustrations in endo that we all know. Uh, so let's do that. So let's do a cleaning and shaping. She'll do her little technique. Now, this kind of sums up. Reagan, do you have any last points you want to talk about? I'm just going to... I don't know if you can see. Oh, there it is. Oh, so, my gosh. Yeah, I've moved. Um, it's upside down. So Major Mark was talking about troughing with a Munzpur. So those are the Munzpurs. You can also use Mueller burrs. I, we have the Mueller burrs here in Halifax. Um, Munzpurs, you, you can get them out of the States. Um, but they're, they come in different sizes, and they're really great for troughing and trying to find those little canals that are hiding, like a metamnesial or a um, MB2. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, so if you need to figure out, uh, the Mueller burrs are, you know, they're just long shanks. Don't You just hit yourself again. Why are you doing that? It's great <laughs> to see you. So, the you know, we're just trying to get, really the idea, uh, there we go. The idea of using these long shank burrs is to, because I honestly thought long shank burrs when I started off, like, okay, well, I'm just going to perforate through the furcation if I'm using a long shank burr. That's really what, I, didn't, I don't know why I thought that. But really what I've learned is that, and I've been taught, that if you use a long shank burr, it pushes the head of the handpiece out of the way so you can actually see what the heck you're doing. Now, again, because we're only using goggles, you know, it's going to be hard to see with your, you know, the full length of the tooth. So ideally what you want to do is, again, reduce two millimeters off that pulp, off the, off the top of the tooth to get, to be able to get better visualization. Open up the axis a little bit bigger. Get all the debris out of there. The Mueller burrs, they're available from like Henry Schein, Patterson, the Munzburrs, if you want to get, like she said, they're um, they're available for, in the states. They're from this place called CMJ Engineering. They're incredible. Your debt can order them. Uh, they've sent to. I've ordered them. Everyone's ordered them. Uh, so, if you don't know how to use them, get a plastic tooth, get some extracting teeth, and practice on those. Any other points there, Major Meadows? I uh, no, I'm good. So, just a couple of questions. Uh, morning, sir. Quick question. This is from Wang. Since we can adjust the speed for electric hand pieces, and many latch type of burrs also come in friction grip, hypothetically, would it be possible to do endo restorative with a single high speed electric hand piece? What would be the downside? I've got a I would say the downside is the head. Like the head of the hand piece is so large that uh, it, it obstructs your view. That, absolutely, that's one of the problems. On the, I'm the optimistic between the two of us. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so what I have done actually is uh, in a couple of private practices, we ran out of, oh, we couldn't order the, so this is really good. So we couldn't, I think it's really good. So we could, they couldn't, it took really a lot of time to order the, the month spurs and I didn't have any in my backpack. So what I did was I use four molars. Um, I use a regular, you know, 200,000 RPM, the long shank, number four. And then what I did was I switched out with the number two long shank surgical burrs and then slow the RPM down to a thousand. 
So that's another way you can use for troughing. So I really appreciate that question. So the answer is, yes, you can totally do that. Just slow it down. The number two, uh, the number two long surgical round burr is a millimeter in diameter, and that equals the number two in the months in the Mueller burr. So you can totally do that. And that's another great point, actually, if you know you're using your handpiece and all of a sudden you're you know an old guy like me and it falls on the floor, you're like, oh, there goes my my slow speed, you still have actually the opportunity to use a friction grip and slow it down. So that's another um, contingency plan as well. The other question that he has is also hypothetically, could our BN air motor in the chair be used for osteotomy implants? Well, I'm going to leave the surgeon talk about that. They're coming up. I, I, if you're doing implants now, man, I don't know. That's uh, I don't think that's emergency treatment, and but it's a great question. You look like you want to say Sorry. something. Well, I, I'd have to. I'm I'm not going to say anything because I don't. I can't speak. Uh educatedly on it but i do believe there's a hand piece but i don't think you can it has something to do with the water and the attachment yeah i'd uh i just use yeah. the stuff we were in the military i mean if we in the right place to order it it's you know it's uh it's been good so you want sterile you want Carlos? sterile water going to your hand piece as you're placing your implant yeah absolutely carlos i see you there are you any questions there my friend i think you're the only person in video carlos we've seen we've known each other for a long time <laughs> Any other questions? Nothing? Okay, so let's end this here. It's been an absolutely great time. I'm so glad that you opened up your screen so we could see where you are, Reagan. And uh Major Mark. Oh, we have a question. Major Mark, this is uh Captain Lee from Gander. Captain um, Lee, how's it going? I'm good. How are you doing? Hope you're hopefully you're staying safe. Um my question is how do you feel or maybe you can just comment on it. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, truss accesses? Uh, well, Reagan, I, I have an opinion on that, but Reagan, do you have any opinions on that? What kind of access, Aaron? Um, a truss access, you know, those ones where you're, you're kind of just accessing directly above, um, I'd say, mesial, buccal, mesial, lingual, and then you do it like a second access where, the, where a distal canal might be. You're conserving, I guess the, the theory is you're trying to conserve the dentin in between. For strength um, of the tooth? Yeah. Um, I've never done one. Um, I guess my only concern would be ensuring that you're not leaving any uh, tissue behind mm -hmm. the hidden bacteria. But looks like Major Mark is pulling up some. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that it's a great question. I think if you can do it, uh, I've tried it and it is a real pain in the neck because it, I'm not saying don't do it. That's not what my point is. Um, it's a great, there is an article and what I'm going to do is it's in the Journal of Endodontics. So trust access, it's obviously not getting me the picture I want, is really we're trying to preserve, it's really denting conser conservation. So go down to, da go down on that one. Yeah. This one? No, up one. <laughs> right there. Yeah. This one? Yes. All right. Is that clear? Yep. So I think if you have the right tools, if you've got magnification and you practice on extracted teeth, I think, I think the world is your oyster. If you, I have tried it. It's been extremely complicated because it was just a real pain in my neck. When I can do a case in one hour like this, this is going to take me an hour and a half because I'm trying to get everything angled and whatnot. So, but what I will do is I'm going to place an article that there was a recent article about the actual influence of strength. I mean, it's an in vitro um, experiment. And I can't speak to what the outcomes were. I do know that if you pretend, if you try to use a post and a trust access like this, it doesn't make a damn difference. It actually makes no difference. So you're wasting your time trying to put a fiber post horizontal. So I know that that one's out. Um, but I'll post that article that talks about an in vitro experiment that's, that compares the difference between doing the trust conservative ninja and traditional access. So again, I have done it. What I honestly would say, try it on extracted teeth and give it a rip first, and then try it on a case that you feel confident that's gonna be simple. As in a huge pulp chamber, maybe it's necrotic, so you don't have pulp tissue underneath this truss, like Major Meadows, so there's no, because vital tissue, I'll be honest, I've done, an, you know, I've done, uh, done a couple of endos, and I'll have, I'll be like, oh, okay, I'm right done at the end, done, cleaning and shaping and I'll take my, I'm like, oh, maybe I'll just remove on the side 
that little bit of dentin. Let's see what's under there. And that vital tissue had been sitting in hypochlorite for probably 35 minutes, and it still hadn't been broken down. And I was really, sh I'm shocked every time. I'm thinking, oh my gosh. So, you know, vital tissue is obviously much, it's not obvious. It's much more complicated to dissolve vital tissue than necrotic tissue. And that leads to a point what I've learned from uh, Trope in a uh, webinar a long time ago. And really, there's an article talking about it. I can, I'll post that as well. Is there an effect on the outcome of using 1% hypochlorite or full strength in necrotic teeth? And it turns out there isn't. So you can actually, you know, if you're scared, you don't want to use full strength in necrotic teeth, you know, you can probably get away with using 1% or half, you know, 50-50. You've got to remember, though, that if, if the tooth is partially necrotic, you still have some vital tissue in another canal, and it might not fully dissolve that. That's really the reason why we're using full strength. Just get it over with, make sure we're going to increase our outcome. So I guess my point is give it a shot and extract the teeth. Make sure you've got a great big pulp chamber. Make it as easy as possible to get success, and then you'll actually feel confident uh, that you'll be successful in that. Is that, I hope that I, that was a really long-winded answer. Any points on that, uh, Reagan? I know. I know. No. I haven't done it. I can't really comment on this. Did you give it a shot? I just, know, I, I just know I wouldn't want to be, I would be in trying to ensure I don't leave any issue behind. Yeah. So I'll put that, put two articles up. I need to remember that from AJ. So AJ, welcome. I really appreciate the, the messages you sent me. I think he's in Shearwater, if I remember. Uh, so for orifice opening, would you reckon using the SX first and then wave and go reciprocating file or reciprocating file right away? You know what, man? I think the thing we've learned that the problem is, is in dental school, is it's a recipe. And I'm gonna tell you, and Reagan can agree, there's no recipe to endo. I think the only thing you need to do is make sure you get, find all the canals, debride them, open them up to, a minimum size there's no and then off you go i think the best way you can do it is get some extracted teeth and practice i hate the sx i literally hate it reagan loves it i think she she has one in her back pocket all the time so there's no i like my agenda huh oh yeah i like my agenda the so 2506 no, yeah so there's no right way i use so the reason why i started you know a long time ago so I started private practice quickly. The reason why I started using the Wave One Gold primary is because I wanted to reduce the number of damn things that got floating around. And I found that because the reciprocating motion is less likely to fracture, that's why I, st I actually use it to find the canals. So try that in extracted teeth. You know what the best answer I have for you is try extracted teeth, SX versus the Wave One. You might like it, you might not. So I hope that answers it. So the next question from Danielle, it's a great question, is, hey man, no worries there, AJ. So is there literature to confirm during reducing the occlusal by two to three millimeters does not significantly reduce the tooth and predispose, predispose it to fracture? Do you reduce all teeth or just teeth that would be crowned? That's such a great question, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to answer that question. And I'm going to leave that to Reagan first, and then I got my, uh, I got my five cents after that. So I think this can be debated quite a bit. Does every endodontically treated tooth need to have a cuspal coverage restoration over top of it? And uh, the literature, I think you have to go to the literature, but uh, premolars, um, those are smaller teeth. And uh, oftentimes, uh, again, if the rules are, if you can keep your access to a, so that they don't involve the cusp tips, like if you don't head to the cusp tips, then definitely I'd be, I'd be potentially considering not doing a cuspal coverage restoration. As soon as I le lose a, a mesial marginal ridge or a distal marginal ridge, you're gonna wanna think about doing a crown. Um, molars, again, um, there's a lot of research out there showing that as soon as you go through that um, uh, Pulp chamber and, and access, even if you have all your uh, mesial marginal ridge and your distal marginal ridge, um, it's really going to benefit from having a crown to reduce crown fracture. However, is there not, there's not as much research out there um, with regards to doing a bonded type of restoration. So could you get away with just doing an endo crown versus a conventional um, uh, crown preparation? Um, so. I know I'm asked that multiple times by the captains, does this tooth need a crown? Does this tooth need a crown? 
and I'll often go and look at the access. And if if the access has been minimal, um, if you look at the screen that Major Mark has up there, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but he's um, like that on that uh, looks like a four six there. If that was the access, then I, I potentially would not jump at putting a crown as long as I was doing a bonded restoration in there. Um, but as soon as you start losing walls and I, that's when I jump at doing a crown. I think you can argue, you can support both ways with the literature is basically what I'm trying to say. Richard Nash. Yeah, thanks Reagan. I really appreciate that. I think one of the things that I've read, um, first of all, I mean, you have, um, it's, I'd say it's pretty, pretty obvious that you need some sort of, it's obvious today that you need some sort of cuspal coverage protection on these on molar teeth. Uh, I think the real question I, that I want you to think about is that, let's take a look. Can you see this picture here? Yep. Yeah, so this, can you see my pointer? Yep. So I think the real question, and this is where minimally invasive endodontics is, that's kind of what they're talking about is, if this is where, let's talk about not occlusal reduction, but let's talk about theoretically how big our access, our orifice opening is going to be. So for example, you do your crown prep, but you know, here there's no preparation in the orifice, but say you open this bad boy up to around here and then you do your crown prep, have you significantly weakened the tooth by doing that, that, you know, the, the access or your access, your orifice is open to say 1.13 millimeters, like in wave one bulb, uh, medium. And then you do your crown prep, which has a 0.8 to one millimeter chamfer or whatever shoulder thing. You know, you've reduced so much of this pericervical dentin, that that's really the question I think that's important to understand. And I think, you know, if you're using Gates Glidens, you're open, I used to hog these bad boys out because I wasn't using loops. I couldn't see anything. So I was like, oh, I'm just going to stick it in there and make it big. But I didn't understand this concept. And uh, what's his name? David and Cotomy, John Cotomy. Uh, you might have David Clark and John Cotomy have a great article. I'll post that too. They talk about you know, keeping the pericervical dentin, and that's become more and more important. Now, is there a lot of articles or a lot of research-based, out, uh, outcome-based research on this in terms of longevity of these teeth in people? There isn't, but it's a more of a hypothetical issue. So, for example, what you can do is doing an endocrown. So I'm going to argue that actually reducing the occlusal is going to save the tooth and then placing something on it to prevent it from flexing is going to be better than potentially doing a crown prep and reducing this pericervical tissue. So this can go down a long path, a long discussion, um, but I wanted to, so that's kind of my answer is, I wouldn't really worry about the occlusal reduction. It's more of how big are you hogging out your orifices? That's kind of my answer. If you are using wave and gold, I would recommend using, uh, opening, placing some sort of occlusal restoration. I hope that answers it. I'm not sure if it, if it does. That's a really great question too. Okay, it does. Yes. All right. Uh, any other questions? Any other comments? Uh, I don't see any. So what we're going to do is let's uh, let's close this up. And I really appreciate you joining us. We got a last session next week, and we're going to talk about the lot. You know, this is going to be the teaser. Is going to be talking about. Major Meadows' secret recipe to get past blockages at the, if you really blocked yourself out, you can't find the apical third. And then I'm just gonna talk about, I don't know what, something about cleaning and shaping, that's what it was. And then that's about it. So go ahead and I haven't had time to do all the individual um, CE letters because we've got a brand new puppy and our life is ridiculous. But I'm gonna get those done, probably at the end of all of this. And then that's about it. So any last points there, Reagan? Uh, no, thank you for joining. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. The replay will be up on the workplace and on the 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 uh, Dental Royale, Dental Core Royale uh, YouTube site. So with that, everyone had a great day. Take care. See ya. You didn't even say bye, Reagan. Come on. I said bye. I said bye. <laughs>